We are now going to move on to surgical methods and considerations. I'd like to invite Dr. Kafir Ben David to the stage. Um, he um, is going to give a 10-minute presentation. He's the vice president of uh, vice chairman of surgery, general surgery program director, chief of GE surgery at Mount Sinai. So thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Please. There's your buttons right here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, um, I'm, I'm local. I'm right down the, the street, and I want to thank the foundation for having me here to speak. I'd like to also say thank you to Dr. Kuzner, who got me involved. I was at the University of Florida for 10 years prior to coming down to Mount Sinai, and um, he's the one that actually got me involved in, uh, in this organization as a surgeon that treats uh, cancer. So <clears throat> my... Um, my sub-talk is gastric cancer and what's new, but before uh, we get any for that, I don't have anything to disclose uh, with regards to financial disclosures. And then I'd just like to take us back in history, because as a surgeon, I, I like to think a lot about legacy. So this goes all the way back to Hippocrates, who first termed the uh, cancer and carcinoma. <clears throat> and as this relates to uh, gastric cancer, we know that in the 1800, it was first described uh, as benign and malignant ulcers by this uh, young gentleman, who then later on, um, we noted that uh, Napoleon, as most of you may know, had, uh, had this ulcer, a nagging ulcer. He was always had his hand in his, uh, towards his side, grabbing at his stomach. And the reason for that is because they felt that he had an ulcer. But in fact, he did have gastric cancer. And he actually desired one of his physicians to open up his stomach to see what was going on. And what they found was that the internal surface of the stomach was occupied by cancerous ulcer. So this goes back way, <coughs> excuse me, way in time, way back in time. And you had about a two centimeter uh, cancer from the pylorus uh, with thickening wall. And it wasn't until the 18, late 1800s where we first started to try to do these gastrectomies. And the reason I'm bringing this all up is because you know, a lot has changed with how we treat gastric cancer, but a lot has also changed the way that we take care of um, uh, surgically. Uh, the first attempted gastrectomy was done in the 18, late 1800s, and the patients didn't do well because this is a fairly morbid uh, operation. And later on, uh, Theodore Billroth, who is a, a world-renowned surgeon at his time, and till this day, we actually use a lot of his techniques, whether we do it open or laparoscopically. And uh, he treated uh, a mother of eight, actually, with uh, who had esophage, who had gastric cancer, and it was a pretty big cancer. I mean, 14 centimeter uh, cancer. It was a T3 N1 by our current standards. Talks about how he did it, what he did, and how long she stayed in the hospital. And as you could see, this gastric cancer was fairly aggressive. She died four months later from recurrence. And then a total gastrectomy with esophagoge agenostomy was done a few years later. Uh, and again, this, was, uh, this wasn't done in, in the U.S. until the, uh, a year before the, you know, the 1900s. And you could see that although we've been trying to deal with gastric cancer for quite some time, not much has changed with regards to how we're treating uh, the patients. The incidence of mortality actually are doubled in men. Uh, this is the latest um, information from the U.S. where the estimated new cases in 2018 are supposed to be about 26,000. As you could see, it's a fairly deadly uh, disease. And cancer in the five-year survival is about 31% for all comers. Here's the epidemiology. Obviously, this affects other countries more, uh, uh, more rapidly, such as some of the Asian countries, Japan and China, where they actually have a screening process for this. Here in the U.S., the incidence has actually decreased, as well as the mortality. And I have to say that's because of the, how early we catch this how in tune the patients are to their body, how easy it is to go on Google and diagnose yourself with, uh, you know, I have a stomach ache or I'm vomiting or I have something and you put that in Google and you can figure out, you at least become knowledgeable to what your symptoms are like. Although everything is decreasing, the incidence of the non-cardia, so the stomach has a few parts to it as, as shown, and the non-cardia, which means 
not next to the gastroesophageal junction, those incidences are actually on the rise a little bit for Americans under the age of 50. <coughs> and there are really two main causes of non-cardiac gastric cancers. And usually we think of gastric cancer that are related to H. pylori, and then some of them for autoimmune gastritis, which are two common causes of why we have uh, gastric cancer. So H. pylori is responsible for about 5.5% of all cancers worldwide. There's risk of infection associated with low socioeconomic status. Somebody showed that there's an inverse relationship. The prevalence of H. pylori infection has clearly decreased in the United States over the past century, which is why perhaps maybe we're seeing less and less uh, gastric, uh, gastric cancer. This is sort of the mechanism of how it, uh, how it works. I won't bore you with those, with those details. But what happens is you have normal gastric mucosa. You have a chronic infections of the H. pylori. You have gastritis. There is some sort of genomic disability, instability, sorry, that, and then there is DNA methylation, which causes atrophic gastritis, which then escalates into dis dysplasia. And then there is some of the genes that are associated converting from dysplasia to inter interstitial type carcinoma. There are other risk factors as well, smoking, obesity, higher socioeconomic, cigarette smoking, alcohol drinking, and some of the things that we're eating. What about if we eradicate this H. pylori? Obviously, this is a very hard thing to do. Uh, there is a point of no return to the development of precancerous gastric lesion, beyond which H. pylori eradication is ineffective. So really, there's no guidelines that actually favor the H. pylori eradication. So there are three different sort of uh, classification scheme that we use for for cancer, we want to know where it's located because it does make a difference of how we treat it, the depth of invasion, and the histological type. So there's a lot of overlap between gastric cancer and esophageal cancer, and this is a seaward classification. And the reason for that is because the GE junction, the gastroesophageal junction, is an area that a lot of patients have cancer, and that's because of reflux in this country and obesity. So a type one is really an esophageal cancer that's about one to five centimeters above the anatomical GE junction. And those patients do benefit from neoadjuvant chemo radiation, surgery, uh, sort of as a trimodality. Then there's a type two, which start to get a little confusing and a little sort of overlapping because you have to decide, is it really a type two or a type three? Because a type two still gets treated uh, somewhat like gastric cancer because the surgical procedure that we would have to do for those patients and type 3 is to remove the entire <coughs> entire stomach and take part of the esophagus as well. So obviously GE junction tumors are as described by Seward depending on where the lesion is from the GE junction how you would treat it. If it's a Seward 3 that gets treated like gastric cancer and you would treat it just like you would a gastric cancer. So the depth of invasion makes a big difference. Sometimes they present as a, as a polyp or sometimes they present as an ulcer, which somebody on the panel had stated earlier. Regardless of what it is, the treatment for it is still the same. You still need to have a biopsy. You still need to get more imaging studies in order to figure out exactly what it is. In early gastric cancer, and this is very prevalent in uh, China and Japan, there are treatments and surveillance programs that actually prevent this process from becoming uh, advanced gastric cancer. And what they are able to do is do endoscopic mucosal resection or even um, endoscopic submucosal dissection, which are actually able to take even bigger pieces of the stomach to prevent from a gastric resection. And as I said earlier, the histological classification, intestinal, diffuse, and unclassified. Obviously, as patients get diagnosed with a gastric cancer, these are some of the symptoms as the patients pre presented earlier today. The diagnosis endoscopy is the gold standard. So getting a biopsy tissue is the issue. So you have to get a biopsy, you have to see your gastroenterologist. Sometimes you do have to push for it. It's not uncommon for me to see patients that have been to a number of different GI doctors because they thought it was different things. First it was the gallbladder, then it may have been the colon, and then eventually they get to somebody who does an endoscopy and they see an ulcer, they biopsy, and they give us the diagnosis. 
Obviously, there's staging for this, and we'll go over this. Most recently, we have to figure out the depth of the invasion because that does change the treatment and how we're going to treat you. <clears throat> so there's a new tool that's called an endoscopic ultrasound that tells us, tells us how deep it is. And this is sort of what it looks like. So it tells us the T staging. And then there is a CT scan that we get, a PET CT scan, or sometimes even exploratory laparoscopy to tell us if there's spread <coughs> of the gastric uh, cancer. Unfortunately, that doesn't get used as much, exploratory laparoscopy, even though it's better at detecting smaller metastases with washing and uh, better visualization. Only about 8% of patients undergo a staging laparoscopy, uh, despite the fact that laparoscopic surgery has um, sort of been the mainstream of, of, of everything that we do. So here's the staging, and I, you, you can find that on uh, every uh, website. NCI has these, uh, and I won't go through that. But as you could see, the, 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 the higher the stage, the less likely of survival that you have, at least five-year survival, which is what we look at. So what is the extent of the resection? Obviously, whenever there's gastric cancer, we have to remove a part of the stomach, either half, two-thirds, or most of the stomach, depending on what it is, and we have to reconstruct that. And as I showed earlier in my previous um, slides is that the way that most of this was done was through an open big incision. And that's a pretty morbid uh, procedure for patients to recover from while they're still fighting from uh, from cancer. So what has changed over the last probably 20 years is the way that we do these types of surgeries. Nowadays we do all these surgeries through small little incisions, laparoscopically, robotically, and we refrain from using big, big incision. And the reason for that is because of this, is because you have less, less uh, operative blood loss, there is much shorter length of stay for the patients to stay in the hospital, there's a much quicker return of diet compared to an open gastrectomy group. And there's actually randomized studies that actually looked at this. So here's a, a class trial that was done as a multi-center trial, <coughs> excuse me, that um, actually randomized patients to open um, gastric resections and laparoscopic. And this trial has been going on for quite some time that there's actually an update to this as well. But what they showed initially when they published this, the interim analysis published in 2010, was that laparoscopically had less, morbid, had less morbidity than the open, and the mortality was no difference. The quality of life for patients who had laparoscopic was much improved in those that had laparoscopic surgery than open surgery. And this continued on where they actually looked at... Um, and this was published in the Annals of Surgery, which is one of our biggest journals in 2016, looking at decreased morbidity of laparoscopic distal gastrectomy versus open. And this was, again, a phase three multicenter. And they showed that patients with clinical stage one gastric cancer is safe and has been benefited of lower uh, occurrence of wound complications compared to open gastric uh, resection. Well, part of the, uh, the issue is that do you do the same operation when you do it open as you do it laparoscopically? And that has to do with the extent of the lymphad lymphadenectomy. So we talked about, uh, the radiation oncologist talked about, you know, having removing the lymph nodes and how many of the lymph nodes are involved. So the operation needs to be the same whether you do it through small little incisions or whether you do it through a big incision. And it's really important to understand that anatomy because when you're doing this, you're visualizing these lymph nodes and you got to remove them. So we always talk about a D1 lymphadenectomy and that's really the major lymph nodes around the stomach. Once he's talking about D2 lymphadenectomy, those also involve some major blood vessels around the aorta and around the spleen and it's really important to get all those lymph nodes because that's the best way to, to get appropriate diagnosis. So there's arguments for D2 versus D1, and I won't get into that because in the surgical world, <coughs> there is um, the consensus is the more lymph nodes you remove, which is why it's required to remove at least 15 lymph nodes when you're doing these type of surgeries, uh, the more accurate your staging is going to be. So obviously where I trained and what I do, I, I, I favor and do uh, 
100% of the time is a D2 lymphadenectomy because it gives our pathologist and our oncologist and our multidisciplinary tumor board individuals the appropriate tools to make the decisions and appropriately stage the patients. And there's really no survival difference between uh, the two other than the fact that a D2 does have a higher morbidity um, in, in it, because it requires more dissection of the, of the stomach. There's also a higher mortality in those patients, but that's because maybe you've diagnosed more or you've taken out more lymph nodes and you've upstaged their, uh, their cancer. But there's really no difference between the five-year survival. Uh, and again, there's Dutch trials, a surgical trial that shows D1 versus D2, and the, you know, although the mortality was a little bit higher in the D2, again, we're upstaging those, uh, those patients. Uh, so obviously the, 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 the recommendations are to do a D2 lymph node dissection um, more than, you know, more than a D1. And then I'll just show that, you know, all these cases could be done laparoscopically. I've published a few papers doing this and I will disclose right now there are going to be some images here that are, might be a little bit, uh, they're operative images, so if you can't look at them, you can close your eyes. And the way that we do these is all through small little incisions, and we're able to get all the lymph nodes and skeletonize all the blood vessels as need to, make all the anastomosis on the inside, and then our patients go home sooner, they have less infections, and they do much better. And that also is appropriate for patients that have partial resection versus total resections, where we could do it the same um, sort of way. So with the advent of gastric, with, with laparoscopy, our patients are actually much quicker at going home and their incisions are smaller and they have less pain and they're much easier to get back to their normal activity. So thank you again for, for inviting me and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, join the panel. I'd like to uh, join our panelists, Joan and... Um yeah, but you, you can come up, yeah. Um, uh, and uh, please, Omar Rashid, who's a, a, a doctor at the complex, he's a complex general surgeon uh, oncologist at Holy Cross Hospital uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. So thank you so much for joining us today. Joan's also gonna join us today as well. <laughs> thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Ben David. I'd like to open the questions first to the audience. Um, so we have one here in the front, please. Uh, this has to do with open reduction versus laparoscopy. Can you see more with open reduction? And as a result, have you ever had the situation where had you not done the open reduction, uh, you would not have seen another issue in the, in the uh, theater, o open incision? Yeah, so I, I think that um, with today's technology, with our high-definition cameras, the laparoscope and the robot are actually able to see up to one millimeter uh, or even smaller lymph nodes. And I actually think personally that the visualization is much better laparoscopically or robotically than in an open era. In fact, when we compared, so we did a study while I was at the University of Florida, uh, we compared the number of lymph nodes that were harvested in the laparoscopic case versus an open case. And this goes both for esophageal cancer and gastric cancer because those are really my two specialties and what's uh, really important to have good diagnosis. And um, we've noticed that we've actually taken more lymph nodes with laparoscopy because you could see more and your hands are not in the way and you're able to dissect that tissue a lot better laparoscopically. Now again, it requires significant expertise to do that and there is a danger in doing that laparoscopically because if you get into bleeding, it requires some extra expertise to take care of that. But uh, I personally think that you are able to see better with the laparoscope because the visualization is better than any human eye. I'd also like to add that especially with the robotic technology, the newer version of the, of the robot where you can use bioluminescent technology where they inject the patient with a dye that's taken up by cancer cells, mm -hmm. that in many cases we can even further personalize the dissection to include the lymph nodes. Right. Because you have to understand that when you look at, it, look at the videos, and you had some pretty graphic pictures there, but for us, it's, lymph nodes often just looks like fat. So it's hard mm -hmm. to distinguish the fat. So literally you're peeling fat off of blood vessels. 
And so uh, some of the work that I've done also is looking at the experience in the East and the Koreas and mm -hmm. in Japan s specifically. And these folks have actually mapped out, just like we do in breast cancer and melanoma, which lymph nodes are draining that part of the stomach. So if you use this technology, some argue that the 15 lymph node ballpark is a general thing, but not everyone's lymph nodes drains the right way. So in some cases, you could miss potential lymph nodes. And the folks who have the largest experience in the world are in Korea, South Korea, and, and Japan, where gastric cancer is so prevalent. And so they're very, very meticulous about the lymph nodes to the point where the surgeons themselves who also have PhDs in pathology take the specimens, take the tumor and lymph nodes out, dissect them out, put them in little boxes. And that's part of the reason why their lymph node dissections are better than ours in the Western world, the US and in Europe. And so I think more and more as technology evolves, we'll be able to really target those lymph nodes because what if you're one of those patients where I might go up into the esophageal area or further away towards the colon, for example. So I think the hope is that this is where we are now in 2018, who knows where things will be in five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move a question to I Joan, I have a question. Um, when you have a total gastrectomy, there is some uh, surgeons who connect the esophagus directly to the small intestine, and some who will create a little pouch. Is there, a, is one better than the other? Has it been studied or proven or? I, I think it has to do with the volume of food that one could eat and the comfort of the surgeon. I do not perform the pouches because I don't think that um, uh, <clears throat> there's two schools of thought. Some of them think that, yes, they could hold more food, but they don't empty as well. Um, and at the end of the day, you can't create as big of a pouch with the intestines as you would f as the previous stomach. And the function of the um, esophagus connecting to the small intestines, the propulsion is a little bit easier for food to get through uh, versus having a pouch that could potential cause an obstruction, which then could cause uh, the inability to food to migrate down. That's, a, but it's a, it's a personal choice on the surgeon. Some surgeons do do it. It's not one's better than the other. It's what you're most comfortable with. Yeah, I'd say it's a bias. I, I was trained by Dr. Lawrence, the Hunt Lawrence pouch up in Virginia. So he had a very strong bias for doing the pouch. And there's a lot of technical experience you need to have with creating the pouch in a way that achieves a larger reservoir to, 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 to be able to take more of a food bolus but not create that problem. Some folks actually, the, what they say is connecting the small intestine directly to the esophagus in the process of doing so do create a little pouch also. So it's not a clear plus and minus kind of thing but it's, he, to your point I agree 100%. A lot of it's bias and experience and so really what the patient should be doing is when they're looking at the surgery trying to understand what that long term what are the real, you know, one, one of the things we have in surgery is that a gastrectomy, especially a total gastrectomy, is a disease in itself. There's a whole post-gastrectomy syndrome that has to be managed. So when you're looking at surgical treatment, you gotta look at the whole experience you're gonna have. What are they gonna do for you to prepare you for the surgery up front? Because it's not just about, you know, this, the technical part of it, but also how they're gonna follow through afterwards. Because every, your life is completely different after your stomach is removed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you have small incisions, big incisions, so you have to have a team that's committed to you for all six steps, from diagnosis to long-term survivorship. And however they do it, there's gonna be complications. And so you have to have a team and feel comfortable with that connection, just like you mentioned earlier about the initial diagnosis, the role of radiation, et cetera. And so it's not, what we joke about in surgeries, the little incisions, that's not what really matters. Even the people focus on scars, hernias, the surgery on the inside is the same, and it's a life-changing experience. And I think in many cases for the patient, I'm sure you, you agree, it's psychologically dealing with now I'm a cancer patient. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. well, my life is totally different. Every time you have a symptom, an itch, you think the cancer's back. Right. And so you have to be a part of that full team. It's not just someone who can offer a technology. It's that whole dedicated team under leadership like, like yours, for example, that can get the patients through that whole experience. To, to highlight more of that point, I mean, it takes a village to take care of the whole patient. And I could tell you that I rely on my medical oncologist, on our radiation oncologist, on our nutritionist who are, you know, we have a nutritionist in our program dedicated for these patients, mm -hmm. psychologist, a comprehensive center 
is what patients should really strive for when they're getting treated for this, mm -hmm. because it's not just about the surgery. I tell the patients, I do the easiest part. I'm right. gonna remove your stomach, I'm gonna reconnect, but you have to do all the hard work. And I think as you, as, as a patient, you probably recognize that, that you have to, you know, get, you know, get, see the nutritionist, see the psychologist, see the medical oncologist, because each one of us has a small part of it, but you're dealing with all of it. Mm -hmm. So it's important to be at a place that can offer all those things. So true. Yeah. <laughs> so very. Thank you for that. Um, does anybody have any questions in the audience? Please raise your hand or fill out a card. Oh, Dr. Lockhart, please. <laughs> So you're saying that the, uh, the utilization of diagnostic laparoscopy has gone down um, recently. I, I, as a medical oncologist, I I'm try to send the surgeons um, so that they'll do the diagnostic laparoscopy. Are there, I, but there are particular cell types that I, you know, when I see somebody has signet ring, you know, that's one of the ones I send for because those are the ones that hide out on scans. And I just didn't know if you had any particular thoughts on that. So I will tell you that nationally, it's not, um, it's not something that's utilized as frequently as, as, uh, as it should be. In my own practice, uh, as we prepare the patient for the modality treatment that they're gonna get, the chemotherapy that we usually give before the gastric resection, is I do take them to the OR and we do explore them and I do do washings and we do, you know, pr do a pretty extensive um, sort of evaluation because it does change in some patients the outcomes of what you're going to do to them because, you know, as we all know, you could do the washings and you could see signet cell, positive signet cells. Mm -hmm. That completely changes the, the way that that patient's going to be treated and perhaps you're going to prevent them from having an unnecessary procedure. Mm -hmm. um, that happens in places that deal with gastric cancer or esophageal cancer or whatever cancer we're talking about. But a lot of times in uh, middle America, that may not happen because they may not have the expertise to do that. They may just think, I just need to put a port for my uh, medical oncologist, let me give the chemo, and then I'll take the patient to the, to the OR for surgery. So yes, I think that in high volume centers, laparoscopy is used frequently, but this, the, the quote that I was giving is overall nationally. Mm -hmm. I agree, in my practice, I do the staging on everyone. I also do ultrasound of the liver, laparoscopically or robotically, just to look for small meds, because the goal is to pr try to not ever take the patient to surgery if they don't need it, to your point. The other thing I would add is in patients who were we're pretty aggressive with doing uh, frailty scores and prehabilitation, and it's the same thing, reevaluating them after chemotherapy, in patients who I think are high risk for surgery, uh, either biologically or based on their performance status, I would even repeat the washings Again, wait for all that to come back and then take them back a third time for the actual surgical resection because you want to make sure that you're selecting these patients appropriately because as, as I mentioned, it's a lot for them to go through. People don't die of the tumor in their stomach or the tumor in their lymph node. They die in the, uh, from the cancer that's made it to their liver or their lungs or other parts of their body. And so surgery is only one tool. It's biology that's king. I mean, to, to your point, the surgery has imp improved, but it hasn't really changed much since the 19th century, the 1800s, it's the chemotherapy that really has come a long way. And now the targeted therapies, we're in a whole new world where even metastatic melanoma is potentially curable. So I think it's very important when oncologists send patients to surgeons, to, to your point, that they're at the very beginning. And not just in terms of the chemo, but to the C-word classification. Is this esophageal cancer or is it stomach cancer? And it's a completely different pathway. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions from the audience? I have some questions online. Um, what is your view on the use of HIPEC during total gastrectomy for stage three or four D2TG? <laughs> uh, it's, so typically we don't do it for, at least here, we don't do it for, for stage three. You, do, you can do that for uh, some stage four. It is a very morbid uh, procedure. Uh, to do, and I'm not so sure that in our uh, current surgical literature that there is uh, definitive evidence to show that that's, uh, that that's that's the way to go. It depends on where you trained and what uh, surgical biases you may have. I trained at a place that we do we did do that. Uh, I will tell you that the complication rate from from doing that is. Uh, is fairly morbid, it's, uh, and I'm not so sure that it adds much benefit considering 
we currently have, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a therapy treatment that, that actually works by getting, you know, three or four rounds of chemotherapy followed by surgery, followed by more chemotherapy. I'm not so sure that mm -hmm. IPEC adds more other than uh, mm -hmm. more morbidity. Okay. Just one quick comment uh, on HIPEC. Two things. Number one, it's, it's a palliative type of procedure, meaning it's not meant to cure the patients, but to control their symptoms or the extent of disease. And number two, the theory behind HIPEC is that you want to get chemotherapy, essentially, the parts of the body that normal chemotherapy wouldn't get to. Mm -hmm. So it's a very subset of biological tumors that somehow come back on the linings of the abdomen that the normal blood supply doesn't reach. And so for that to really provide a benefit in gastric cancer, it's a very, very small subset. So again, just like all these other treatments that we talk about, it's selecting the patients appropriately. Even the folks who advocate it are very selective on who they, they do it on. And so it shouldn't be offered routinely. Mm -hmm. And people shouldn't think that it's necessarily going to cure them either. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification on HIPEC. Uh, I'd like to move on to the patient experience. Joan, can you tell us a little bit about what your very short, because we're out of time, um, a short experience on um, your gastrectomy, what side effects you had, and any tips you might want to give to patients? When I went into surgery, um, I, they thought I was at a very early stage, probably stage two, um, <laughs> and they gave me a 5% chance that I would have my stomach removed totally. 5% I went into surgery with. I had two surgeries at the same time. I had a very small tumor on my kidney, 1% uh, chance that anything would happen with that. And so they had two separate surgeons operating on me at the same time. The surgeon that uh, did the total gastrectomy started his surgery, and everything looked pretty good, so he let the other surgeon then take the um, little tumor off of the kidney. Then he went back in to complete his surgery. I was in there for eight and a half hours because he could not get a clear margin on the one side where the esophagus is located. So he made the decision for a quality of life for me not to go any further up my esophagus than he had to, which was just a little bit, and he connected my esophagus to my small intestine and told me that I would have to have chemo and then chemo and radiation. I was in the hospital for 12 days, went home for two days, and then came back with a major infection and I was on antibiotics round the clock and in the hospital for another um, six days. Oh. So it, it certainly was a journey, and, um, and I'm, you know, I'm here today. I did have um, side effects from all of it, but probably the same side effects that, you know, a lot of people have. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the panel. What a wonderful session. Thank you very much. Round of applause.